All right. Hey, hey, ladies. Uh, welcome to day 25 of the Freedom from Emotional Eating Bible Study. Yesterday, we had a couple of um, some some sound issues. So I thought I'm going to go ahead and just pre-record today for you ladies. Normally, we are live for those of you who are just catching this for the first time. And you don't know what we've been doing here. We've been doing a Freedom from Emotional Eating Bible Study. We've been going through by Barb Brabling. This is a 40-day Bible study. And and this is a, it has been an amazing tool to help me break free from emotional eating and so many others as well. So I definitely want um, you to just jump in right now today. If this is the first time you're ever catching that, um, hey, today's for you. You haven't come at the wrong time. Day 25 is the best day to start. Okay, so just start with us today, and then if you if you love what God is doing and what He's saying to you, then you can go back and um, catch up on the replays. They're all archived right here on YouTube. They're also archived on the Wait on the Lord podcast here on YouTube and also anywhere you listen to podcasts. So you can go uh, search out my podcast. It's called Wait Like the Heavy Weight, Wait on the Lord, because um, that is really what we need to be doing casting all our cares, putting all our weight on the Lord. So you can go back and watch that, but, um, let's go ahead and jump in. This is going to be pretty short and sweet today. Um, ladies, we're going to be talking about the subject or the emotion of boredom and boredom is a big deal because a lot of us, I know struggle with, um, eating because we're bored. <laughs> like, hmm, what are you, what are you eating for? I don't know. I'm just really bored. I need something to do, right? Like how many of us have either done this, said this, or, um, bad with us at some point in our lives. I, this was probably one of my biggest issues for a long time, um, was just boredom eating. So let's go ahead and break up with boredom eating. We're going to start doing that today. So we're on page on, uh, excuse me, if I can speak, we're on page 103, my little guy, he's five years old. He asked me one day, he's like, mom, why do you say 100? And, or why do you say a hundred? And why do I say 100? they're different. And I was like, no, they're the same. It just depends on, you know, who you are and what you say. So I was trying to say 103, but it's 103. <laughs> All right, let's jump in today. We're going to talk about boredom. Like I already mentioned, this is one of the most common motivations for eating when we're not hungry. And there's two reasons that we get bored. Either we have nothing to do, or we have a lot to do, but it's all pretty boring stuff and we don't really want to do it, right? So we're going to spend the majority of the lesson on the first type of boredom, and we're going to cover the second type at the end of the lesson. So let's begin by looking at the culture's answer for boredom. If you have time on your hands, how does the world say you're supposed to fill it? Well, I think the world kind of like pushes us into finding something to do that, you know, is focusing on self, right? A lot of times watch TV, play games, scroll social media, or maybe just work more, like find something to do work. Right. I know that when my kids are like, I'm bored. I'm like, would you like to scrub a toilet? And they're like, no, never mind. I'm not bored. You know? <laughs> and, uh, anyways, um, so I'd be curious. She said to see your answers. It kind of depends on, um, you know, where your world is right now. So some of you would say something like maybe find a hobby. Others would say, get a job. And still others are going to say something like, just go do something fun. If you're bored, go find something fun to do. But there's nothing wrong with doing any of these things. When our mind immediately jumps to filling our times with things that's going to make us happy though, we're missing out on one of the main messages in the Bible. So let's look at this passage. We're going to read um, Mark. We're going to read Mark chapter 10, um, verse 35 through 45. So let's go here. All right. So sorry, let me get there. All right. When James and John, the son of Zebedee came over and spoke to Jesus, they said, teacher, we want you to do us a favor. I can't imagine talking to Jesus like that, but they're really seriously like connected, I guess. So anyways, he says, what's your request? He asks, they reply, when you sit, when you sit on your glorious throne, we want to sit in the place of honor next to you, one on the right and one on the left. But Jesus said to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering? I'm about to drink. Are you able to be baptized with the baptism of suffering that I must be baptized with? Oh yes. They replied, we're able. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, we got this. <laughs> then Jesus told them, you will indeed 
drink from my bitter cup and be baptized with my baptism of suffering, but I have no right to say who will sit at my right or left. God has prepared those places for the ones that he has chosen. So when the other 10 disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. They were mad, right? So Jesus called them together and said, you know, that the rulers of this world, Lord, you know, in this world, lorded over their people and the officials flaunt their authority over those who are under them. But among you, it will be different. Okay. You're, you're going to be different. Okay. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. Ooh, well, maybe I don't want to be a leader. Maybe I don't want to be first. Actually, you can be the line leader today. I'm good. Right. So he says, for even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. So what kind of life is Jesus asking his disciples to live? He's asking them to live a life of servanthood, right? To be a servant. So what is the difference between the lifestyle the world tells us we need to live and the lifestyle Jesus tells us we need to live? Well, the world says you deserve to be served right? Be first, be the best, be at the top, right? That's what it says versus serving others, putting them first, living for God's desires instead of our own. And that's just my fill in the blank. You can put in your own opinion there. So now back it up a bit and let's read Mark um, chapter 10. We're still in Mark chapter 10. We're going to read verse 32 through 34 really quick. So we're going to read these two verses together. And they are now, they were now on their way up to Jerusalem and Jesus was walking ahead of them. The disciples were following behind and they were very overwhelmed with fear. Taking the 12 disciples aside, Jesus once more began to describe everything that was about to happen to him. Listen, he said, we're going up to Jerusalem where the son of man will be betrayed to the leading priest and the teachers of religious law. They will sentence him to die and hand him over to the Romans. They will mock him, spit on him, flog him with a whip and kill him. But after three days, he will rise again. Now we're going to scroll on down. I'm on my Bible app. That's why I say scroll, or you can go on down to 45. We're going to go down to verse 45 for even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. He just told them all the terrible things he was going to have to endure and ended it in 45 in verse 45 by saying for even the son of man came not to be served, right? Um, but to serve. So what kind of life did Jesus live? And why do you think he lived that way? And she says, when you answer this question, think not only of his death, but also of his life while he was, you know, living on this earth, what kind of life did he live while he was walking around? Right. So I, I wrote, this is a fill in the blank, but I wrote, he served, right. He gave, he lived for the sake of others. He died for the sake of mankind, but while he was alive, he lived to help others. Like he was always trying to find somebody in need and fill a need. And he wasn't afraid. He wasn't afraid to touch sick people. He wasn't afraid to go in and do the hard things. He just saw a need. He had compassion. So he served people, right? So what would you need to change about your life to make it more like Jesus's life? Well, I, I would say to stop focusing on myself and what I need and, you know, what I desire or want and serve others first. Would it be really hard to live a life of service for you? And you can answer this, you know, I mean, pretty easily when you, that question in your mind, you probably answered it in 10 seconds. Why or why not though? Would it be easy for you to live a life of service? Well, for me, honestly, it's not hard for me. Uh, and I'm, this is not to be boastful, but listen, I've been in the service industry. That was my very first job. My service was uh, at 14 years old. I was scraping gum off of baseboards and, and cleaning floors and stuff because I wanted to serve my school and I was a janitor and I loved it. Then I became uh, a, a waitress, which they call servers. And I loved serving people. I loved helping them. I loved giving them, you know, what they needed and made making their day better. Right. So I don't think that it's hard for me to, to live a life of service unless, okay, unless I am being overwhelmed with too much to do and I'm not taking time to take care of myself. I'm saying yes too much and service becomes more like, you know, no boundaries and people pleasing and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So it's not hard for me as long as I'm staying filled by the creator God and taking care of my relationship with him 
first. Okay. So living our lives to serve others can be a foreign concept for most of us in a lookout for number one world. It often doesn't, you know, even cross our minds to serve others. And I know that a lot of you are like, no, I, I do serve others, but there may be some of you that are like, yeah, I guess I don't really think about other people like that. So this isn't to point my finger at anybody. This is, she wrote it, not me, by the way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but when we do think of serving them, we feel like we should be rewarded for our efforts. If not financially, then at least they should be grateful, right? Like, gosh, they didn't even say thanks or anything, you know? <laughs> Do you think that Jesus felt like everyone was grateful for all the things he did for them and for all the, the or and for just the death on the cross? Do you think that people were grateful? No, I don't. I really don't. I think that there were so many of them who Jesus touched physically in you know, IRL, like in real life that turned from him and crucified him and said, and pointed their fingers to say, crucify him, crucify him. They just turned their back on him. Right. Um, and so what do you think was Jesus's motivation for serving us? Even though he knew there would be some that he would take care of and serve that would still reject him. His motivation, according to John three sixteen and first John three sixteen, isn't that amazing? They both say love. Love is the answer. He loves us, right? So let's read another passage. We're going to explore a little bit more. Um, we're going to read Luke chapter 10. And we're going to read verses 25 through 37. Let me get there really quickly. Okay. So one day an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question, teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, well, you must love the Lord, your God with all your heart, your soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right. Jesus told him, do this and you will live. Okay. So the man wanted to justify his actions. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? <laughs> All right. So who's my neighbor? Well, Jesus replied with a story and then he gave them the story, the parable of a good, the good Samaritan. And for the sake of time, I will encourage you to read the parable of the good Samaritan on your own. It's um, verses 30 through 37. And we're going to go through the parable of the good Samaritan. So definitely go read that. That's verses. Um, that's Luke chapter 10, verse 30 through 37. What did Jesus say? is the most important commandment. Well, he said, love the Lord, your God with all your soul, your strength, your mind, or your heart, mind, and soul. Some people might say, so love the Lord, your God with all of your soul, strength, and mind. And the second commandment up on page 105, the fill in the blank, the second commandment that was just as important. Secondly, is to love your neighbor as yourself. Now I want to just like pause skirt. Hold on one second. How can you love your neighbor as yourself? If you don't love yourself, first off, okay? So loving yourself in a non-narcissistic way, in a healthy way, where you know who you are as a son or daughter, you um, you know, need to know how to love yourself first in order to love your neighbor. So if you love your neighbor as yourself, as you currently love yourself, are you loving your neighbor really well? And if you're not loving your neighbor really well, then it's, good, it's time for some good self-evaluation. Why not? Why am I not loving my neighbor really well? And so that's really important to understand. It's super vital that you learn who you are in Christ, how valuable you are, and you know how he sees you and all the things in order for you to love the creation that he created as, as, as a human being walking, breathing around, you know, in his image, loving yourself in a way. So you have to take care of your body, take care of your mind, um, take care of, of your, of your life, right. Take care of your finances so that you can love your neighbor if they need some food and you can bring them groceries or, you know, that's what I mean by that. Okay. So love yourself so that you can love your neighbor. According to the word, he says, love your neighbor as yourself. And in what, what ways in the, the story of the parable of the good Samaritan, what ways did the Samaritan have to sacrifice to end up loving the man that was laid out on the side of the road, right? Somebody had beat up this guy, the, the basic gist of the story. Um, some robbers came, beat up this guy, took all his stuff, left him on the side of the road um, to die. And several people had went by. There was, you know, some sets of people that had went by, you know, some were like priestly people and some were just regular guys. And then here's this good Samaritan. He comes by and he's like, wow, okay, hold on. This guy's dying on the side of the road. 
road, let me stop and help him and, uh, and, and take care of him. And so he didn't have to do that because the first two sets of people that came by didn't stop to help him at all. They just kept on going on about their business and moved. They even walked to this on, on the other side of the road, like as far away from that guy as possible. And, uh, and just chose to ignore him. Like he's going to have to deal with his own junk. I got stuff to do. Right. So the good Samaritan had to sacrifice his time. He had to stop. He was on his way to do something. He wasn't just out moseying around for the day. It seemed like he was probably on a mission for some business, right? So he stopped. He sacrificed his time. He sacrificed money. He, he sacrificed his resources because he paid for that guy to go, you know, to be put up at an inn and basically like a little hospital kind of place where the guy could be taken care of and nursed back into health. Uh, he dropped him off there and he said to the innkeeper, he said, Hey, take care of this guy. Here's some money. And Hey, guess what? I, I got to go. I can't stay around. I really, I'm still on the way to some place, but he stopped on his way. He stopped in his tasking, his busyness of life. And he said, I'm going to help this guy really quick. I took him, put his oil, like his resources, his oil and wine on his wounds and, and brought him to someone to take care of the rest of the time. He paid the guy his own money. And then said, if there's anything else that's not covered by this money, when I get back, I'm going to give you that money. I'm going to take care of you. Don't worry. Just take care of whatever this guy needs. It doesn't matter. The cost doesn't matter. Do whatever it needs to be done to make sure that he's comfortable and he's, he's healing and he lives. Okay. And I'll pay you when I get back and off he went. So he sacrificed a lot. That's a big deal. So why do you think that the other people in this story didn't stop to help the injured man? This is such a fun story to share with my five-year-old. I love this story. So I think it's because they were just focused on themselves. They were just too busy, wrapped up in what they were doing. And they had just had a lack of compassion, lack of concern for other people just busy doing what they were trying to do. Put the blinders on, keep going, act like you don't see it, you know, just, just keep on going. So when we're bored, why do you think service to others isn't the first thing on our list of things to do? Hmm. That's a good question. <laughs> that's a good question. And so I think maybe because we're always thinking about our own self, you know, I'm bored. Well, let me see how, who else I can help. No, no. What can I do for me? Yeah, this is a big deal within in our home, in our home. I'm trying to teach my older um, child to notice when there's a need instead of just sitting mindlessly watching TV, you know, to say like, hey, is there anything I can do to help you get outside of yourself, serve others, serve your family, serve your grandparents, serve your mother, serve your sister. How can, you know, do you have know someone who has little kids that just needs to take a bath? <laughs> <laughs> go serve that woman, take care of her children for her for an hour. Let her go outside and breathe and drink a cup of coffee without snot slinging and screaming babies and all the things. Let her take a nap. What an amazing way to serve someone, right? You're bored. You ain't got nothing else to do. You want to just sit around and eat or go serve this woman. So anyways, um, just look about, look at that. Okay. So there's a couple fill in the blanks that you can go through here on page 105, but Jesus tells us to love our neighbors. And then he goes on to tell us who our neighbors actually are. And they are anyone that is in the position of needing help. Anyone that's our neighbor, anyone who needs our help anyone. So the traveler on the road in this parable needed help. And the Samaritan was in a position of being able to help him. So can you think of any neighbors, people in your life that could really use your help? Like I just suggested a few, <laughs> I wish that there was people around that would have thought to serve me in that way when mine were little. <laughs> so if you were to serve one person in your life this week, who would you serve and how would you serve them? If you had extra time on your hands, list a few ministries or volunteer activities that you might be able to get involved in. What's the first step that you want to take right now this week to get involved in one of those opportunities? So answer those questions for yourself. And if you have time on your hands, you know, time is a great resource. We tend to waste that a lot, but uh, it's a great resource that God can use. So look around and see who needs help in your church or in your community. And then, Hey, this is the way I see it. I say this all the time. Find a need, fill a need, find a need, 
fill a need. You're never going to be bored if you're always doing that. Okay. <laughs> Look around, see what you can find that you, you know, you can help out with. Um, check in your community. Maybe there's um, local volunteer, you know, agencies, there's positions where you can go and rock babies. I don't know, at the NICU, at the hospital, something like that. You know, what can you do? There's all kinds of opportunities, you know, out there to keep you busy. So, um, you know, excuse me, I think I skipped a little thing here that I wanted to say. There we go. If you're ministering in the areas of your gifts and desires, you're probably going to have a lot of fun as you serve and minister to people. And God's going to bless you as you bless others. So now, let me say a word to, the, um, to those of you who don't have much free time, but you find yourself bored. Okay. If you don't have much free time and you find yourself bored, this is kind of silly, right? And you're like, what? I'm some people say, you know, I've, I've actually said this to people, like I know in your free time, if that even exists. And I've said that before, cause I'm like, sometimes people will say, Hey, if you get some free time, I'm like, oh, well, time's not free time actually costs me a lot. Um, and I don't have a lot of free time. Like I, I just, I'm busy all the time. I feel like I'm always finding something to do. That's my problem to be honest, but she wants to talk to people like me and you right now, if you're in the same boat. Okay. So I know it's hard to live in a boring situation. If you're a person who craves excitement, everything in us wants to get out there and have fun. And our tendency is just to do whatever we can to escape the boredom, if not physically, then at least mentally. But here's a question that we need to ask ourselves in the situations. Well, has God called me to this situation? And is this a situation that I actually need to be in right now? If the answer is yes, then we need to submit to God. We talked about submitting yesterday. I know it's not fun, but if you missed yesterday, go back and watch yesterday, like the last 10 minutes or so of the Bible study where we talked about submitting and why and how to do it, you know, in a biblical way. Um, so that, you actually, you know, aren't going to fight it and it's going to be helpful for you. So anyways, um, if you need to, uh, submit to God and stay there, you know, sometimes life is boring and that's just okay. It just is sometimes. So God can use board. <laughs> he can definitely use board and he can also change board. He can change that, right? As you run to him for help with life, he's going to help you be more content with every situation and in everything, right. It's going to help you be more content. So when I look back on life, it's often those difficult periods of time that I'm most thankful for, because I can see how God used them for my good. So don't leave a situation that God's placed you in just because it's not exciting or it's boring, right? Instead, do what you can to liven it up. If you really need the excitement and just accept the rest, just accept it. Okay. God's going to use the situation for your good. So if you're in a boring situation right now, can you think of anything that God might want to teach you through this trial? My first thought was perseverance. I think in my boring situations where it's not as exciting and I'm just doing the same thing, like on a, a hamster wheel over and over again, busy doing the same thing. It's not fun. It's not glamorous. It's not exciting. I don't often, I don't want to do the things right. But uh, he's teaching me perseverance, patience, and gratitude in those seasons of doing the ho-hum mundane daily parts of life, right? To, to just continue to teach me to persevere, push through, to have patience and to be grateful. So if you struggle with boredom, can you think of any practical things that you can do to liven up your life while you're in your current situation? If you're doing this Bible study with a group, you could share these ideas with others and we are doing it as a group. <laughs> you can share these ideas with me in the comments. So share your ideas about what you can do to liven up your life, to, to bring some excitement to the boring everyday humdrum. I'm so busy. I don't actually have time for fun or excitement in my life. I'm going to tell you mine right now. You can type out yours in the comment uh, comments, but here we go. I think you can do coffee dates, go to the gym and take some classes. There's so much fun to do, I think at least, to do classes with a group of people like Zumba or bar classes, something fun, you know, go to the gym, take a class, be with people, right? Uh, do a scrapbooking group, something like that. Walk 
walk in a new place. Like if you like to go outside and walk, walk in a new place. It's exciting. It's new. Go on a different trail, take a different, you know, hike, whatever it is. Uh, visit some local shops that you've never seen in your area, little, you know, downtown shops or whatever, go thrifting. Thrifting is treasure hunting and it's so much fun and it will like kick boredom out and you'll have a lot of fun. <laughs> So she says, my friend, any life can be a good life if we're living it for God and with God. So in closing, record Paul's words in Philippians 1, 21, and let that be your attitude. And here's those words. If you want to write them down, this is a fill in the blank. So you can record these words for, to me, to live is Christ and die is gain. That's Philippians 1, 2. So ladies, what are you going to do? Tell me in the comments. I gave you some great ideas, but what are you going to do? Do you like any of those guys? You know, those ideas, um, going on coffee dates, going to the gym and doing like, um, you know, together workouts, things like that, uh, scrapbooking, checking, you know, checking out a new place to, to go take a walk or whatever. Like, I don't know. What's, what are you going to do to bring some excitement in your life to have some fun? <laughs> Let me know in the comments, ladies, that's it for today. We're going to go ahead and jump into week six on Monday. I'm very, very excited about this next emotion that we're going to be jumping into, which is anger. Urgh. We're going to be dealing with anger. And I'm so glad because there's a lot of angry people out there um, being mean for no reason and it's not fun, but let's learn how to deal with our anger so that anger doesn't trigger us to go jump headfirst into a bag of Doritos and eat, you know, with Ben and Jerry all weekend long. So, and in saying that we're starting the weekend. Okay. This is Friday, day 25 of the Bible study. So we're going into the weekend. I want you to already put ahead in your mind that you're not just going to throw all your boundaries out the window because it's the weekend. Um, you know, keep those in place. Keep your head on about things. Remember what you've learned so far. Practice truth journaling and reach out to me in the comments. Reach out to me in the Revitalized Biblical Wellness Facebook group for help and support when you're struggling. And just take this one day, one moment, one opportunity at a time. And let God speak to you in whatever he is speaking to you about. Um, but yeah, set a timer, put it on your calendar, give yourself a little reminder to get up and join us Monday morning at 6 a.m. Um, 6 to 7 a.m. is when I typically am, you know, keeping it in on uh, YouTube live. And if you can't come live, that's okay. You can still catch the replays. Just put it on your, your calendar to go back and watch. And we're going to dive into anger next week. So, so far we've really been dealing with a lot. We've dealt with worry, discontentment. Now we're going to be jumping into anger next week. And we only have uh, three more weeks to go ladies. So yeah, we're going to be in six uh, week, six next week out of eight. So uh, six, seven, eight. Six, seven, eight. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, y'all. I've got to get some sleep. I'm just, I am sleeping. I feel like I just got to go to bed earlier. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for hanging out um, with me today. And I look forward to seeing y'all here on Monday and uh, don't forget to share this with a friend and uh, yeah, we'll see you. Have a great weekend. Bye.